بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وإمام المتقين وعلى آله وأصحابه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من صلى علي صلاة واحدة صلى الله عليه عشرة أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العلم الحكيم ربي زدنا علما بالقرآن العظيم وبسنة رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين Today is the 144th lesson of Al-Adab Al-Mufrid Only through the sheer mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah has allowed it so that For the last consecutive 143 Fridays now We have been sitting and discussing the work of Imam Bukhari Rahmatullahi alayhi And as I've mentioned now um, Literally Literally well, I'm not going to say the exact number but Within one hand you'll be able to count how many lessons we have left now. That's how far it's gone. And Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, through the sheer mercy of Allah, Allah has allowed us so that we've discussed the work of Imam Bukhari, Rahmatullah the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I mentioned to you all now that Imam Bukhari is ending the book. Imam Bukhari, Rahmatullah wants to really summarize very crucial parts of our life. And with that, Imam Bukhari, rahmatullahi alayhi, what he has introduced now in the last final approximately 150 ahadith are the core points of life. The let's summarize our life. How should we be as good Muslims throughout our whole life? Imam Bukhari, rahmatullahi alayhi, last week on purpose, I, I kind of stalled in my... I've, I've got mental note of how many ahadith I want to cover because a very dear brother came yesterday, last a week to the hadith class and um, because he was a non-Muslim brother, we focused on the importance of smiling and we focused on how our deen is based on good character. And Alhamdulillah, uh, as many of you know also, Alhamdulillah, Thumma Alhamdulillah, um, last Friday, I actually found out on the Saturday after, uh, which was um, the fact that it was World Smile Day on Friday. It was World Smile Day. And we were focusing our whole Hadith class last week on smiling. And that day was actually the world smile day last week. So it's amazing how it works out. Allah Ta'ala give barakah. May Allah Ta'ala accept. Mm -hmm. And the chapter that we're going to start today, I said to you, Imam Bukhari Rahmatullah is going to end in style. And from amongst the things that he wants to speak about, Imam Bukhari Rahmatullah, he wants to speak about, well, he, wants, he doesn't want to speak about it, he wants to just mention um, circumcision. And in Bengali and in our language, we call it Muslim Nikham. Muslim Mani Kham, that's what we call it. So Imam Bukhari, he wants to mention this uh, heading in al adab al-Mufrad, Babul Khitan, where he's going to discuss about the importance of circumcision. And before I mention that hadith, there are a few hadiths that I'm going to read in front of you, inshallah, and then we'll discuss them. Uh, just a very important point about this is that our deen is very complete. And from our deen, we have to understand that there are a few points that we really neglect. And I'm going to mention it as I've started today's lesson. And I'm going to just kind of hint, I've already hinted towards it when I mentioned on the text that I went out today, the importance of cleansiness. How we need to be clean people. So inshallah, as we talk about this, we will realize. But I am going to mention something, because we're all adults here, and those listening <laughs> at home, it's very important to know that our deen is so precise and so pure that actually doctors, scientists and doctors say that it's very important to protect yourself from infection. Mm -hmm. And what happens many of the times, and this with the normal uh, water, I'll give you a very simple example, the athlete's foot, 
know, people that have uh, problems in between their toe fingers and you know in between you know, toes and they've got problems with their skin one of the biggest reasons is because for example after doing wudu or after washing your feet people put on uh, socks or they wear soggy socks, uh, socks or they walk around with the same socks for, the, for two weeks without changing their socks so these cause problems and Islam promotes being clean in the same way when me and you go to relieve ourselves to the toilet especially men that Allah Ta'ala has made a system in, so, in such a way that there's a possibility of infection of dirt being in that specific area, that our private area. But Allah Ta'ala has made a system where it's known as a sunnah, it's known as a good act to make sure at a young age that a person, he really protects himself by doing circumcision. So we learn the great health benefit of it. And many people make many comments how it is very healthy, it is the best way to protect yourself from infection, from spreading inspe- inf- inspe- um, infection, from diseases, and from having any sort of problem down there. So our deen focuses on our health too. The upsetting thing is, we don't focus on our health. When it comes to looking after ourselves in the way we eat, the way we uh, exercise, etc. Everything is promoted in Islam. May Allah make us amongst those people that really do focus on their health also. So here, these next few hadiths, inshallah, I'm going to read the full um, uh, chapter. I'm going to read the hadiths from the chapter and then we will, inshallah, talk about them as we're reading. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَبِي قَالَ أَمِيرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ فِي الْحَدِيثِ أَبُوْ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ مُحَمَّدْ بِنْ إِسْمَاعِيلَ الْبُخَارِي رَحِمَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى أخبرنا شعيب من أبي حمزة قال أتذنا حدثنا أبو الزناد عن الأعرج أن أبي هريرة رضي الله تعالى عنه أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال اختتن إبراهيم عليه الصلاة والسلام بعد ثمانين ستة واختتن بالقدوم قال أبو عبد الله محمد بن إسماعيل البخاري رحمه الله تعالى يعني موضعا وبين قال حدثنا زكريا بن يحيى قال حدثنا ابو اسامه عن عمر بن حمزه قال اخبرني سالم ان ختن ابن ابن عمر رضي الله تعالى عنهما انا ونعيما فذهبها علينا كبشا فلقد رايتنا وان لنجزل به على السبيان ان ذبها عنا كبشا وبين قال امير المؤمنين في الحديث وبين قال امير المؤمنين في الحديث ابو عبد الله محمد بن اسماعيل البخاري رحمه الله تعالى قال حدثنا سليمان بن حرب قال حدثنا حماد بن يزيد ان يحيى بن سعيد أن سعيد بن مسيب رحمه الله تعالى أن أبي هريرة رضي الله تعالى عنه قال اختتن إبراهيم عليه الصلاة والسلام وهو ابن عشرين ومئة ثم عاش بعد ذلك ثمانين سنة قال سعيد إبراهيم أول من اختتن وأول من أضاف وأول من قص الشارب وأول من قص الظفر وأول من شاب فقال يا ربي ما هذا قال وقار قال يا ربي زدني وقارا أو كما قال عليه الصلاة Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi wants to mention to me and you in this chapter of circumcision the Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Who is Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam? Our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam, once he was describing the messengers of Allah, he described Musa alayhi salatu wasalam and he described Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. And he described them to be a very beautiful physique, etc. But when he described Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, that the physique and the dress and the appearance of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam is like that of your companion, meaning of himself. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam he explained to his companions that Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam is our forefather. He is my father, he is our father. From his progeny, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam came through Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam explains, explained to the companions that I'm like Ibrahim in my physique, that me and him were very, very close in the way we looked. So our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the most handsome. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's form was the best of all of forms. So you can just imagine that Hazrat Ibrahim Alaihi Salatu Wasallam was also a very, of a very beautiful nature and of a very beautiful physique. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam explains to the companions that Ibrahim Alaihi Salatu Wasallam, as mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, that Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he was circumcised at the age of 80. Mm. Now everyone's thinking, Ya Allah, you know, we get circumcised at the age of 8 months. Or you know, for some people, you know, maximum 3, 4, 5, 6 year olds uh, by that time. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, why was this the case? Because Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he was informed, he was instructed at that age. That was a very big question. 
that you know some people become new Muslims. People become new Muslims at the age of twenty, at the age of twenty-five, and they didn't when they were young. They didn't have their you no. Know, they were they weren't circumcised. So what's the ruling for them? The ulama explained that obviously when you've hit such an age, you're twenty, twenty-five, thirty, forty. It's too difficult at that age. You can't expect someone to go through that physical pain. Because it's a pain at that age. So a person cannot do that. And at that moment in time, it's not recommended for that person either. Everyone is unanimous to say this. You don't need to at all. But why did Ibrahim do this? Because Allah instructed him. And because Allah instructed him, for his case, it's a completely different scenario compared to everyone else. So now, as we've learned also through um, science and through understanding this, that people do this. Why? For cleansiness. And where do we learn this from? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was explaining the circumcision exists in Islam. He said this is the sunnah, this is the way, the practice of our forefather, i.e. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam. This is why we practice this. There's another question now. Our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was he circumcised? So the ulama, they differ in this opinion. Hafiz ibn Hajjar al-Asqalani rahmatullahi alayhi he mentions that there are three opinions. From them three opinions, I will mention all three and I will tell you which is the most favored opinion. One opinion is, Hafiz ibn Hajjar al-Asqalani rahmatullahi mentioned <coughs> that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa his grandfather, Abu Muttalib, uh, Abdul Muttalib, what did he do? At the age when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was a young boy, on the seventh day we hear, or in another generation, eight, uh, one year later, two years later, he himself organized that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam circumcised. Uda mentioned that no, it was a later age, when he was four, five, six years old, when he was with Bibi Halima radiallahu ta'ala anha. That's when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was circumcised. But the preferred opinion, and Hafiz ibn Hajjar al-Sqalani says, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa is the best of all of the creation of Allah. The ulama, they, they have sukut. They want to remain quiet on this matter, but they say that the preferred opinion where you don't need to discuss more is that the Prophet ﷺ, when he was born, he was already circumcised. Mm-hmm. There was no need for him to go through that. The Rasul ﷺ was already circumcised. So Rasulullah ﷺ, it was all, also in his life. The ulama also, now in this hadith, the next few hadiths, one hadith comes that I mentioned to you is Ibn Umar. And so what happens in our culture is, as soon as someone is a Muslim and come, you give shinni, you give food out, and you tell people, you invite your friends, your family, close family. And you know, I know I'm, what, I'm 24, 25 years old, I still remember when I had mine. And I'm not joking, I was 4 or 5 years old, I still remember. And I still remember who did it. May Allah Ta'ala have mercy upon him, he's passed away now, Dr. Chowdhury. Many people know him from Olden. May Allah Ta'ala have mercy upon him, may Allah forgive him any of his shortcomings. May Allah give him a high place in Jannah to Firdaus. So, I hated him then. I hated him for a very long time and I hated him then when that happened. Uh, but I still remember and I remember all my cousins came and my relatives came, my mamu came, my khala, and everyone came. So we do this, we do this thing. it's a celebration that Alhamdulillah my son has become a Muslim, he's become a Muslim man. That's what everyone believes. Is this found anywhere? Is this found that, you know, inviting people for food? Can you do this? We find Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, we find from Salim who was his son. Salim says that myself and my brother Naim or Nuaim, when we both had a, 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 we were circumcised, Fadhaba alayna kabshan. Ibn Umar, who is the son of Umar bin Khattab, who is also a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, from me and my brother. So Salim says, from me, from me and my brother, he sacrificed a goat kabshan. He sacrificed a goat, and what had happened? He had um, invited family members to eat from that goat. As a shinni, as a token of, to say that Alhamdulillah, I have fulfilled this sunnah for my two children. And uh, Salim says that me and my brother Naim, we used to feel proud. And we used to tell the children that after we were circ- circumcised, our father, Ibn Umar, ta'ala anhuma, he had a da'wat for us. He made a meal for us. He uh, announced to the people that my sons had, had been circumcised. That he made a deal out of it. So do we find this? Alhamdulillah, we also find this. Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi has mentioned this in Al-Adab Mufrid, hadith number 1246. That you can do this. That you can invite others and you can call them to your house. Now, one more question remains. Uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in this hadith of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa 
we find that Ibrahim alayhi salatu was at the age of 80, he was, circum- he was uh, circumcised. What else was special about Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam? The ulama exp- explain, Imam Bukhari rahmatullah alayhi, Imam, Imam Muslim mentioned this hadith in their works also, that Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam is amongst those people, he is the first. What do we mean by first? Awwalu man ikhtatana. He is the first person to be circumcised. Does that mean that no one before him was circumcised? No. He was the first person, meaning that in Sharia, in Deen, in religion, it became part of religion to be circumcised. So Ibrahim والسلام, is the first prophet of Allah where it became part of the religion. So that's number one. Why else? وَأَوَّلُ مَنْ أَضَافَ Ibrahim والسلام, is the first from amongst the prophets that it became a sunnah, a way of his prophethood, that he hosted some guests. Who did he host? We find in the Quran in Karim, Surah Al Hud, which is a uh, para 12, uh, Juz 12 in the glorious Quran, that Hazrat Ibrahim والسلام, when his nephew Lut والسلام, when he was instructed by Allah to leave his community. He was instructed by Allah to leave his community, and Ibrahim والسلام, to him some guests came. In the hadith and in the Quran verse, we find that there were three guests that came to Hazrat Ibrahim When they came in, it was the honor of the guest that when the guest, uh, he, uh, when the guests come in and the host presents them, that the host will place some food and it's an etiquette that you eat something from that food just to show appreciation that we respect that you've you know, prepared for us. So Sarah alayhi salatu wasalam, the wife of Ibrahim and Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, prepared food and he presented it in front of these three guests. And these three guests, they didn't eat from the food. So Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam tried to fear. But you know, why have they come? They're not eating from my food. Is there something wrong with the food? What's happened? That these three guests are not eating. They became very fearful. Then Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam in that fear, whilst in that state, in the glorious Quran, we find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says through these three guests, that don't worry. Ibrahim, don't worry. We are not normal guests. We are not guests Rather, we have been sent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibn Kathir rahmatullahi alayhi says, Shall I tell you who them three guests were? Those three guests that came to Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam, he hosted three guests, and I don't think anyone else will ever get an opportunity to host such three guests. Who were they? Hazrat Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam. Hazrat Mikail alayhi salatu wa salam. And one narration we find, it could be either Israfil alayhi salatu wa salam or Israel, the angel of death. But we find that the three arch angels of Allah, they were the guests of Hazrat uh, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam. So now in Islam, it became part of the sunnah to host people. It became part of the sunnah of the life of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam and in our lives that you should host. You should host people. You should take people as your guests. What else? وَأَوَّلُ مَنْ قَصْتَ الشَّارِبْ And Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam, it became part of cleansiness, it became part of sunnah, that you should trim your tash. You should trim and look after your hairs. And وَأَوَّلُ مَنْ قَصْتَ الزَّفْ And you should also trim your nails. وَأَوَّلُ مَنْ شَابَ And Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam is amongst the first that when his hair became white, it had significance. When his hair became white, it had significance. What does that mean? He said to Allah, Ya Rabbi, ma hadha? Oh Allah, what is this? What is this white hair that I see? What is it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Waqar. It is dignity, it is honor, waqar. It is nobility. Guess what Ibrahim said to Allah? Ya Rabbi, zidni waqaran. Oh Allah, increase me in nobility, increase me in honor, i.e., increase me in my white hair. So Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, we find that he was gifted with the white hair, and it meant something for him in his sunnah. What does it mean for us? Let me share with you a hadith of the most beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is a hadith of our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wherein the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that when a person has white hair and he has reached old age, he is weak and feeble, and he raises his hands to make dua to Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has haya. Allah finds it it's not suitable for me not to forgive this person. Allah finds it incumbent upon himself to forgive that person because of his old age, because of his white hair. There is an incident mentioned from the Salaf al-Salihin and it's 
noted, and it's worthy for me to mention too, wherein there was a young man, he passed away. Before he passed away, he passed away in a state where he had normal hair, he didn't have white hair. But before he passed away, he said to those around him, that after I pass away, I want you to put some white powder on my beard and on my hair. And in that state, uh, put me inside my grave and bury me. They were confused, I know, <laughs> what's with the white powder, why white powder on the hair and the beard? So they did as, as he instructed, he passed away. Someone saw him in a dream. And I always say this about dreams. Dreams are not the final outcome. They don't symbolize that it's definitely this. It's a very good alam, a very good sign, a very good indication. So somebody saw him in a dream. And in the dream, they asked him that, you know, how did Allah deal with you? How did Allah deal with you? When the angels came to ask you, you know, man rabbuk, you know, ma dinuk. No, man, Nabi, you know, how was it? So the person said, Allah forgive me. Allah forgive me my misdeeds. Allah forgave me and Allah has promised me Jannah. So how? You know, what was it? What deed was it? There was no deed. It was that action that when I instructed people to cover my beard, my hair with white powder. I will explain. So the person in the dream says that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala questioned me, why did you do such a thing for? Why did you put white powder on your hair and on your beard? Why did you do that for? So he says, I said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, I had heard from my teacher, who had heard from his 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 teacher, who was blessed to hear from his teacher, Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha who was blessed to hear from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was blessed to hear from Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, who was blessed to hear from you, that you, O oh Allah, has said in a hadith, a Qudsi, that when a servant of mine comes in such a state where he has weakened, where he has white hair, he has white hairs, and he asks for forgiveness, he asks something from Allah, Allah finds it upon himself to forgive that person because of his old age. Oh Allah, you said them words. Because of this, I wanted to imitate this look that I have come to you as an old man and as a person with white hair. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, what your teacher said to you was true. What his teacher said to him was true. What his teacher said to him was true. And what his teacher said to him, meaning Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, was true. Whatever Aisha was told from Rasulullah sallallahu was true. Whatever Jibreel said to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi was true. And what I said to Jibreel, was true. Allah forgive him. Mm-hmm. If a person wants the whole sanat of this hadith, inshallah we look it up. Mm-hmm. I, I can see in front of my face where he is. The actual teacher are narrated that he said this in the dream. <clears throat> that I heard from my teacher. The teacher was named all the way back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So having white hair, reaching old age, some people think it's a burden. <coughs> it's a mercy from Allah ta'ala. So what can me and you do? We don't have white hair right now. We're not that old. Alhamdulillah. What we can do is though, those around us in our lives, those uncles, those grandparents, those parents, if your father is of that age, if you know anyone of that age, ask dua from them. Their dua is readily accepted in the court of Allah. Ask dua from them. That person you see in the masjid just sitting there praying Quran all day long, or just going masjid and back, masjid and back, they have a value in the sight of Allah. They have a great value. They raise their hands and they make dua to Allah. It's possible their duas will be ten times faster accepted than mine in your dua. So appreciate that. May Allah make us amongst those people that really appreciate this. وَبِيْنِ قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا حَجَّاجٌ مِّنْ مِنْ حَالٍ قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا حَمَّادٌ بِنْ سَلَمَةٌ أَنْ ثَابِتْ أَنْ أَنَسْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَالَ عَنْهُ قَالَ ذَهَبْتُ بعبد الله بن عبي طلحة رضي الله تعالى عنهما إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يوم ولده أنس رضي الله تعالى عنه says that my stepfather أبو طلحة أبو طلحة married أنس's mother أم سليم رضي الله تعالى عنها when they moved to Medina منورة he says my stepfather أبو طلحة when my mother أم سليم gave birth to their child meaning أبو طلحة and أم سليم's child عبد الله then they took the Prophet, it took the child to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَالنَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فِي عَبَاتٍ يَحْنَهُ بَعِيرًا لَهُ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was uh, relaxing, he 
he was in Medina Munawwara, relaxed. The Prophet ﷺ was in a place where Abu Talha found the Prophet ﷺ. فَقَالَ And he presented Abu Abdullah, the baby. فَقَالَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ مَعَكَ تَمَرَاتِ Do you have dates with you? The Prophet ﷺ said to Abu Talha. Do you have dates? قُلْتُ نَعَمْ Abu Talha says, yes, I do. فَنَاوَلْتُهُ تَمَرَاتٍ فَلَكَاهُنَّ صلى الله عليه وسلم I gave the dates to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم One or two dates The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم took out the The seed of the date What do you call it? The seed of the date And the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم started to chew onto the date He allowed his saliva to really soften the date The blessed saliva of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم After doing so ثُمَّ فَغَفَرَ الصَّبِيُّ وَأَوْجَرَهُنَّ إِيَّاهُ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa took out the date which he had already um, chewed on and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam placed the date inside the mouth of that child, Abdullah, that baby. فَتَلَمَّذَ الصَّبِيُّ The child, Abdullah, started to quickly, quickly start. No, it's, you know, so he started to nibble, nibble quickly onto the date. A child, for the, this is the first food that this child is tasting. Nothing he's tasted yet. And he's nibbling onto the date. And you know, the sweetness of the date, he's you know, nibbling onto it. فَقَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ The Messenger of Allah started to smile, looking at the child. And he said, حُبُّ الْأَنصَارِ التَّمَرِ Indeed, the most beloved food to the people of Medina is dates. Mm. Look at this child, you know, first thing in his mouth and he's going for it. Mm. He's having that date. And then, وَسَمَّاهُ عَبْدَ اللَّهِ And the Prophet ﷺ named the child Abdullah. Here there's a very important point, And I'm going to mention this to you because Alhamdulillah I have seen my respected teachers do this. Tahnik is called tahnik in Arabic. Tahnik means that when a child is born a baby, the first morsel, the first food that that child should take as barakat, tabarrukan, is that a person goes to a pious servant of Allah, they chew on something sweet, ideally dates, and then they place that mixed saliva, that mixed uh, date inside the mouth of the child. So it starts to uh, you know, nib onto the uh, food, onto the date. And then because it's mixed with the saliva of the pious servant of Allah, that's the first morsel of food that enters the belly of that child. What's happened today, and my respected teacher, Sheikh Bilal, Hafizahullah Ta'ala, because this same topic and this same hadith comes in Sahih Bukhari, and because we are studying this hadith with him right now, just last week he mentioned this hadith, Tahnik. There's a very big problem that me and you have done now. First of all, Tahnik only happens after the child is born. That's number one. What some people, people do is that they go to their sheikh or they go to a big sheikh or a very pious person, that sheikh, uh, my wife is expecting in the next one month and the next two, three weeks, can I present some dates to you so you can chew on it and I'm going to save them and I'm going to give it to the child. So that's not correct. Why is it not correct? And sheikh Bilal mentioned, you know, very important issues of health, which is, what do we normally do when we give dates? We put it into a plastic bag and we give the dates. So he goes, first of all, when you've given it and the pious person has mixed his saliva and he's put it back into the plastic bag, that plastic bag, a bag could be infectious. It could be dirty. So now you've mixed the saliva of someone and the date and you've put it into a plastic bag and plastic do give off certain chemicals. That's dirty and it's infectious. Now you're going to feed that to the child. That's not good. Secondly, if the child isn't born and you're going to save someone's saliva, by the time the child is born, that saliva is going to dry up. And tahnik means literally means that the child is born and the first morsel that the child finds is the food, the saliva mixed with a date, with honey, whatever it may be, and it comes to the child. It should be the first thing for the, that the child has. So now what me and you have done, we made it a custom like, I'm going to save the day and I'm going to make someone big sheikh, you know, come on, uh, chew it and then give it to my child. The point is, the big sheikh should be someone local. Someone that you can actually go to and they can give it to you there and there. As in literally the child is born and you go to someone and they do tahnik. I myself, I'm not a big sheikh. I'm nothing of that sort. May Allah Ta'ala protect me from ever thinking anything of myself in my own life. May Allah Ta'ala raise me in such a way that in the sight of people I become very big. But in my own life, in my own sight, I am very small and I remain very small. So once one of my cousins, he had a boy, he's called Zain now, mashallah, he's four or five years old. And I remember the morning that he was born, that brother of cousin of mine, he was in Fajr with me. And then he got the news. We rushed to hospital and we had with us a date. 
And there was no one else there. It was just me and him. And his wife had given birth. Alhamdulillah, mashallah, very beautiful baby boy. I'm the first person there. So Azan was given, Iqamat was given. And because there's no one else available, so I did the chewing of the date and I gave to the child. And now that we've studied the hadith, I realized that, okay, maybe I'm not the pious person. But that's the actual sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That it happens after the child is born. So what's the better way? If you still want your sheikh and if you want someone big or a very pious person to give this, there's a very beautiful option which Sheikh Bilal uses, so I'll mention it to you. He has small jars of honey. So what does he do? As soon as the news comes that someone is, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I've got a child, alhamdulillah, I've been blessed with a baby boy, baby girl, and they've come and they don't bring the child, so the child is not in front, and people bring dates. He goes, I'm going to keep the dates for myself, I'm going to eat it, but I will give back something to you. So he has a small jar of honey, he puts his finger into his mouth and he gets the saliva and he mixes the honey in the small jar and then has the honey, he mixes it again so his saliva is mixed with the honey and then he says, now take this and give it to the child. Because that is more closer, less any problem of any infection, any disease, nothing will happen because it's in a glass jar, small little jar, give the child this and the sunnah will also be fulfilled. So we should think about these things. Those of us that are married, may Allah, if Allah blesses us with children, we should think about these kind of things. It's not always about going you know, all the way to, you know, I don't know, London and getting the blessed, you know, day, being blessed by someone else or by the blessed sheikh. Keep in mind the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah make us amongst those people that um, do fulfill this. Imam Bukhari rahmatullah wants to say to me and you, I've sp- sp- I spoke about circumcision. Why did I speak about circumcision? Because the first step to having good children is that before children come into life, that you are very clean in your dealings and you are very clean when you have that husband and wife time. Now he's mentioned about children. One or two things he wants to say about children. Hazrat Muawiyah bin Kurra Rahimahullahu ta'ala says I was blessed to have a child called Iyas My child, Allah blessed us with a child called Iyas What did I do? I went to a group of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam What do we learn from this? When you have children You should take your children to the pious servants of Allah They will make dua for that child so uh, Muawiyah says, I took my child Iyas to a group of the companions of the Prophet Wasallam that I had access to. فَعَتْعَمْتُهُمْ I fed them. I gave them food. I fed the pious servants of Allah, i.e. the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. فَقُلْتُ I said to them, the, uh, indeed you have made dua for my child. When pious people gather and they're eating, then the baby is brought. And they're like, may Allah you know, bless this child. Then another person kisses it. And then another person is like, oh Allah, give barakah. Allah make him a very pious person. Allah make him very pious. They make so much dua. So Muawiyah says, indeed you've made dua for my child. Fabaraka lakum. And may Allah bless you in this. That you made dua for my child. But I've got one more request. Now look how clever this Muawiyah. Rahmatullahi alayhi was. This tabi. He says, inni ad'u bi du'ain. Now I'm going to make some dua. You've made dua, okay. You've made dua, but it's possible after making dua, yes, Allah could have accepted. But there's a few things that you didn't say. I'm going to make dua now. Fa'aminu. I just want you guys to say amin to the dua. So now he's going to make the dua. And what does he say? Muawiyah says, I made dua for my child. He asked, I said, Oh Allah, increase him in his knowledge. Increase him in his understanding. Increase him in deen. Increase him in dunya. Give him wealth. Give him barakah. Made so many duas for his own child. And these pious servants that were in his house, that are just at, they're all saying, Amin, 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 Amin to that dua. What do we learn from that? That yes, request the dua of the pious. But after requesting their dua, and you say to them that Sheikh, whoever you are, Sheikh, Haji Saab, Sasa, Uncle, that make dua Allah makes him a pious servant. Make dua Allah accepts him for the service of Islam. Please make dua he becomes a very young, intelligent boy. Please make dua Allah makes him amongst the most pious women of our time. You also hint towards certain words. 
and inshallah that will be the case that they will make dua and they will say ameen to your duas too that is very very important while someone making dua that's a very beautiful thing but saying ameen is also very very important too so Allah make it so that whenever we are in these situations we get the dua of the pious and we ourselves request the dua of the pious وَبِيْقَالَ حَدَّثَنَا مُوسَى بِنْ إِسْمَعِنِ قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا عَبْدُ اللَّهِ بِنْ دَكِينَ سَمِيَ كَثِيرٌ مِنْ عُبَيْدٍ قَالَ كَانَتْ عَيْشَةُ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَى عَنْهَا إِذَا وُرِدَ فِي مَوْلُودٌ لَا تَسْأَلْ غُلَامًا وَلَا جَارِيَةً Do you know when a child is born, as soon as you hear that, Alhamdulillah, I've been blessed with a baby. The first thing everyone asks is, is he a boy or a girl? That's what everyone says. In this hadith we find that whenever any of the family members of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, any of her cousins, any of her brothers, the family or her sisters, anyone had children, she would not say, Ghulaman wala jariyatan, is he a boy or a girl? Is he a boy or a girl? You know, that's the first thing you want to know. No, you've had a child. Is he a boy or a girl? Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she never used to ask about that. She used to ask something else. She used to say, Taqulu. Is the baby okay? Is he or she intact? Any disability? Any problems? And then the reply would come uh, The child is okay, no disability, no problems, nothing of that sort. Then she would say, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Me and you, we focus on the wrong things. Aisha, it's not about being a boy or a girl. The first question is, is the baby okay? Boy or girl, is the baby intact? Any disability, any, dis, you know, any sort of illnesses, anything that could harm the child. That's what she wanted to know first. So Allah make us among such people that we ask regarding the actual person, for if it's a boy or a girl. That's not a problem right now. We can sort out if you need to get the pink you know, boutique or you have to get the blue one. That can be later. Ask if the child is okay. Ask if the mother is okay. Ask regarding them. Show that you care for people. We learned from Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, they were more focused on the actual well-being of a person rather than the small petty things that me and you focus on today. Now, very very important for me and you this next hadith. وَبِهِ قَالْ حَدَّثَنَا سَعِيدٌ مِّنْ مُحَمَّدٍ الْحَرْمَيُّ قَالْ حَدَّثَنَا عَكُمْ إِبْرَاهِيمٍ قَالْ حَدَّثَنَا بِيَانِ بْنِ إِسْحَاقَ أَنْ مُحَمَّدٍ إِبْرَاهِيمٍ مِنْ الْحَارِثِ الْتَيْمِي أَنْ أَبِي سَلَمَةَ مِنْ عَبْدِ الرَّحْمَنِ عَنْ أَبِي هُرَيْرَةَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى عَنْهُ قَالْ قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ خَمْسٌ مِنَ الْفِطَرَةِ Indeed there are five things that are from the natural order of a human being. What are they? قَصُّ الشَّارِب that that person he trims his tash, his mustache. وَتَقْلِيمُ الْأَظْفَارِ He trims his or her nails. وَحَلْكُ الْعَانَ That he cleans the private areas from hair. وَنَطْفُ الْإِبِتْ That he also cleans his underarms, his armpit hair. وَالسِّوَاقِ And that he brushes his teeth and looks after his teeth. May Allah forgive us. In every single five of them we all fail. We fail in every, every single one. When it comes to looking after our tash, Allah have mercy, some people have such a height for having a tash. It comes, you know, drooling down their lips and drooling down everywhere when they're drinking and eating. You can see bits of food and bits of milk and water stuck on their tash. No, Islam promotes cleanliness. We should be clean. Today, Allah have mercy, it's become a cool thing to have long nails, especially women folk. No, Allah Ta'ala doesn't want that from you. Allah hasn't made that natural for you. Allah doesn't want you to have massive long nails. Keep your nails intact. Yes, can women put nail polish? Are they allowed to do that? That's a different story. That's beauty for them. But the question here is, keeping extra long nails, like, you know, looking like daggers, you're going to attack someone? That's not what Allah wants from you. Allah doesn't want that kind of stuff. So we should look after ourselves. You know what the problem is with us? And Allah have mercy upon us, some people, and sometimes ourselves, we'll have such long nails that, Ya Allah, you've got the whole of, you know, probably the whole of all of them stuck inside the nails. So much dirt, so many things. And it's embarrassing to talk about it with the reality. Our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to teach the Sahaba all this. That no, you know, you need to look after yourselves. Once some people came from a different area, we find Iran or Iraq, and they came long tashes, long big tashes. The Messenger of Allah turned away from them. Two men came. He turned away. Because that's not in Islam. Islam doesn't promote, you know, having, you know, having a wild look. Some people actually, you know, you know what they say? Some people say, you know, when you're pious, piety means that you look, you know, shoveled all the time. You look as though, you know, you've got stains of salad and dal and everything else on your clothes and you, you don't look after yourself. No, Islam promotes being clean. Our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when you look into his shamail, we find out that the Messenger of Allah used to comb his beard. He used to oil his beard. 
The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to apply itr. Are you going to say that, you know, that's not piety? That's the ultimateness of piety. Imam Malik rahmatullahi alayhi we find when he used to give durus in Medina Munawwara. Every single day he used to give dars. Every single day he used to wear a new pair of clothes. Every single day. And after wearing on that day, before, after Isha, Salah, when he would go into his uh, you know, nightwear, he would give that to one of the students as a gift and say, this is for you. Next day, that's how much wealth Allah gave him. He used to wear a different uh, pair of clothes every day. Before starting his durus, he would apply itr. And then he would start. He would apply itr onto the book. He would apply itr onto himself. And then he would start his durus. Islam says you should look good. You should smell good also. You know, we were talking in the WhatsApp group about, you know, how some people have the, you know, the crazy breaths. And I mentioned this a few weeks ago in the Jannah program. I'm going to say it again, and Ya Allah, I actually do so much shukr to Allah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, that Allah blesses me with the tawfiq to lead salah in Taraweeh. Why? Because when he's standing with everyone, that's the hardest part. And I also make shukr to Allah, Allah, please allow me to do extra rakats. Like, you know, give me 8 rakats, 12 rakats, 14 rakats to lead. Why? When he's standing in a line, Bismillah, Rahman, you're standing. Blah. Ya Allah. The whole of iftar, the list of you know, what they had. Yep, they had sheikh kebab, yep, they had bara, yep, they had onion bhaji. Everything comes out. You know, Islam says no. We find in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that if you've just ate something with garlic or onion, Rasulullah says that don't. Don't come to the masjid until after you rinse your mouth, until after, you know, the smell's gone away. We find in the books of fiqh, and we're not talking just one fiqh, we're talking on a general basis in fiqh, we find that can you miss a jama'at? Can you miss, you know, congregation of salah in the masjid? There are a few reasons. Guess, guess what? From the reasons, one reason is, if you don't smell nice, if you don't smell good, if you've got a problem of sweating and you've got, you know, a foul smell, you know, anything of that sort, you are excused from jama'at. You're excused. The fiqh tells us you're excused. Why? Because you're not meant to give difficulty to anyone else. And it's so, so important that we do look after ourselves. And you know, you might find that you know, you know, I'm talking to kids or we're talking, that sort of way. It's not, it's the reality. Some people, I'm sorry to say, that you know, they've got probably bushes growing down there under the, under the armpits and hey, they're not looking after themselves. You need to. And you also, another thing, and we'll all realize, sometimes uh, we think that we smell okay. And even if you think you smell a bit, trust me, it's probably ten times worse for the people around you. So we need to look after ourselves in that respect. And it's so, so important. It's to the extent we find in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, that if a person has allowed up to what, 40 days to pass in a state where he has not cleaned himself, he has oppressed himself, he has done wrong. He has gone against the command of Allah and His Rasul ﷺ. So that's how important cleansiness is. So if anyone is telling me and you the opposite, I'm sorry, that's wrong. Our deen promotes being clean in every sort of way. And now, to, you know, some people say that, you know, if I just use miswak, it's not enough. To, the reality is the ulama actually have written now, the later, last 200 years, the ulama write, our food is very different to the food of those people of the past, the Salaf al-Salihin. They ate very simple. Their food was very simple, was very organic. So when they used to eat, it wasn't a foul smell. It wasn't a bad smell emitting from their stomachs. My food and your food has changed a lot. A lot of it's processed. It's chemical based. It has so many reactions and so many foul smells come from our food. So for me and you, miswak, with miswak, the ulama actually say, if there's any sort of, for example, toothpaste or any sort of minty thing, we should be using that also. Islam promotes this. That you should be looking after yourself. You should be, you know, uh, having that, that thought inside you that I need to I need to look after myself teeth they're a blessing from Allah for the rest of our lives you know I had one tooth out and I'm telling you it hurts and you think to yourself you know I remember when I went to the dentist about two years ago the way he looked at me you know, I was like oh god you know he's like oh okay those are very bad teeth hmm. and you feel like yeah you know you feel shy I spoke to one of my friends who's a dentist and he said this to me and I didn't really think of it until when he said this to me which was Shall I say something to you, Atik Pai? Oh yeah, please tell me. Because you know, we dentists, when we speak to people, guess what's the first thing that we look at? We look at the te teeth. And they're saying, if you don't look after your teeth, then there's a big problem, because what else are you not looking after? If you can't look after your teeth. Because we pick on these things. We check if people actually brush their teeth or not. And it's very important for me and you. So Allah makes us amongst those people that really do put emphasis on this. Can I make a further point? 
Rasool Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, At-tuhuru shatru al-eeman. That cleansiness is half of faith. Shatr in some respects and in some places in hadith we find shatr means half. A very big portion. At-tuhuru shatru al-eeman. In one explanation of this hadith we find that cleansiness is half of iman. And another place we find cleansiness, i.e. wudu, is half of salah. In Islam, everything is to do with the cleansiness. When you go into the state of ihram, before going to ihram, the recommendation is that you clean yourselves, that you make sure that you take away any hair, that you're not going to be able to cut in the next five, six, seven, eight days. Islam prepares you. Islam tells you that make sure you prepare yourself. Clean yourself. Jumma day. Have a ghusl. It's sunnah to have a ghusl on Jumma day. Me and you, you know, if you're not having a shower, having, doing a ghusl, it's very, very important that we do. It's very, very important. And being men especially, we actually sweat more than women in general, normal cases. I think there are some women that probably sweat more too, but that's a different case. They shower more than us anyway, alhamdulillah. But we should keep these things in mind. Allah makes amongst those people that keep in mind. Now the last chapter I'm going to read, there's about 10 ahadith. So I'm going to uh, recite every single of the 10 hadith and I'm going to stop and then I'm going to inshallah give you a quick summarized understanding of what the hadith is saying. But whilst I'm reciting the hadith, please listen very carefully. Why should you listen very carefully? Because the words of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, just the utter words of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is very beneficial and is a means of barakah and mercy. وبه قال حدثنا يحيى بن بكير قال حدثنا ليث عن عقيل عن ابن شهاب ان اخبرنا حميد بن عبد الرحمن ان ابا هريره رضي الله تعالى عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من حلف منكم فقال في حلفه باللات والعزى فليقل لا اله الا الله من قال لصاحبه تعالى اقا اقامرك فليتصدق وبه قال حدثنا حفص بن عمرو قال حدثنا خالد بن عبد الله قال اخبرنا تامن السائب ان سعيد بن جبير ان ابن عباس رضي الله تعالى عنهما في قول عز وجل ومن الناس من يشتري لهو الحديث قال الغناء وأشباهه The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's companion Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhumah says that indeed there are some people that they play with words. What does this mean? Ibn Abbas explains saying that music, singing, when a person sings and those futile talk which is compared to singing, indeed he has sold his words and he has done a bad thing. وَبِهِنْ قَالَ أَدَّسَنَا مُحَمَّدٌ مِنْ سَلَامٍ قَالَ أَخْبَرَنَا نَفَزَارِيُّ وَأَبُوْ مُعَاوِيَ قَالَ أَخْبَرَنَا قِنَانٌ مِنْ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ الْنَحْمِي أَنْ عَبْدِ الرَّحْمَانِ مِنْ عَوْسَ جَانِ الْبَرَى بِنْ عَازِبْ رضي الله تعالى عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أفش السلام تسلم والعشرة شر Indeed, spread salam. It is a means of peace for you. والعشرة Useless, futile activity, futile talk, sharrun, indeed it is evil. Don't involve yourselves in petty talk, in gibbet, in backbiting, in just wasting time, in making futile conversation. وَبِهِ قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا إسماعيل بن قال حدثنا مالك أن موسى بن ميسى أن سعيد بن أبي هند بن أبي موسى شعري رضي الله تعالى عنه أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال من لعب بالنرد فقال فقد عصى الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم وبه قال حدثنا مسدد قال حدثنا معتمر قال سمعت عبد الملك أن الأب الأحوص أن عبد الله بن مسعود رضي الله تعالى عنه قال إياكم وهاتين الكعبتين الموسومتين اللتين تزجران زجرا فإنهما من الميسى وبه قال حدثنا محمد بن يوسف وقبيس قال حدثنا سفيان أن علقمة من مرصد أن أبي بريدة عن أبيه عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال من لعب بالنرد شير فكأنما صبغ يده في لحم خنزير ودمه وبه قال حدثنا أحمد من يونس ومالك من إسماعيل قال حدثنا زهير قال حدثني عبيد الله قال حدثني نافع أن سعيد بن أبي هند عن أبي موسى رضي الله تعالى عنه عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال من لعب بالنرد فقد عصى الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم وبه قال حدثنا إسماعيل قال حدثني مالك أن علقمة بن أبي علقمة أن أمه أن عيشة رضي الله تعالى عنها أنه بلغ أن أحل بيت في دارها كانوا سكانا فيها عندهم نرد فرسلت إليهم لئن لم تخرجوها لأخرجنكم من داري وأنكرت ذلك عليهم وبه قال 
قال حدثنا موسى قال ربيعة من كل ثوم من كل ثوم من جبر قال حدثني أبي قال خطبنا ابن الزبير رضي الله تعالى عنه فقال يا أهل مكة بلغني عن رجال من قريش يلعبون بلعبة يقال لها النرد الشير وكان أعسر قال الله سبحانه وتعالى بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنما الخمر والميسر وإني أحلف بالله لأوتي برجل لعب بها إلا عاقبته في شعره وبشره واعطيت سلبه لمن, لمن أتاني به وبي قال حدثنا الحسن من عمر قال حدثنا يزيد من الزري عن حبيب عن عمر بن شعيب عن أبيه عن عبد الله بن عمر بن عاص رضي الله تعالى عنه قال اللاعب بالفصين قمارا كآكل لحم الخنزير واللاعب بهما غير قمار كالغامس يده في دم خنزير أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام Here the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ahadith and his companions say that there's a game and we call it in English translation we call it backgammon Have you heard of Them two black and the white pieces At the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and before the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the Arabs used to play this game But when they used to play this game they used to bet like that, for example, that if I win, you have to give me that uh, amount of land. If I win, give me that many golden coins. If I win, give me silver coins. They used to bet on this. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam came and said that those that play with uh, laib, those that play with this sort of uh, game, indeed it is wrong for them. And then the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam made uh, made certain comments. Amongst them was the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that that person who involves himself in this game, in this sort of gambling, it is the same as that person who eats uh, and, and drinks from the blood and eats from the meat of pig. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam made it very severe for the Muslims because Muslims don't eat pig. That's part of our belief. Alhamdulillah, it is in the glorious Quran. We're not saying anything bad about pigs. We're just saying that we don't eat them. So Rasul sallallahu explained that the way, even to this day, you know, if you see to someone, that it's like eating pig, like, oh, I don't want to eat pig. No one wants to eat pig because they see some sort of disgust, whatever it may be, they see something. They associate disgust, they associate that you can you can have everything else in life, just don't have pig. You know, you can have, you know, you can drink wine and everything, but just don't give me pig. Some people have this sort of mentality. Which is a bad thing, but at the same time, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, that they still see the hurmat and the fact that Allah has made pig forbidden for them. At least they understand that much too, which is the great favor of Allah Ta'ala, that they see that as haram. It is better to see at least one thing as haram than completely disassociating yourself from deen. So here the question is, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that backgammon and this sort of game is wrong for you, because you gamble with it. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says, Whoever has done this, فَقَدْ أَصَى اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ Indeed, he has disobeyed Allah and he has disobeyed the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa In another hadith that I narrate in front of you, you find Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she heard that someone from amongst the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after the demise of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they were involved in this sort of game. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's wife, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, said that if they were to play in my house, then definitely I would take them out of my house. That you're not allowed to even stay in my house for playing such a game. From this we understand, and the ulama say, that such games where there is gambling involved, where there is money involved, casino, where you are gambling, where you are taking money, exchanging, and taking money from it, them sort of games as we know from Islam, Maysir, as was mentioned in the glorious uh, verse of the Quran and Kareem, wa innam al khamru wal maysir, that indeed alcohol, wine, and indeed gambling is from the evil of shaitan. It is from shaitan. Rijsum min amali shaitan, which is found in the para 7, Juz 7, the second side of para 7, Surah Al Ma'idah, you will find that Allah Ta'ala says it is rids, it is dirt, it is evil from shaitan, from the actions of shaitan. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said not to do this. Now the question is, does, does that apply to every game? Is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa saying to me and you that you can't play anything? No. To ulama, may Allah ta'ala continue to elevate them. May Allah ta'ala accept all of the effort of the ulama. They explain that those things that have any sort of haram involved with it, where you're dealing with gambling, where you're dealing with any sort of haram, they are forbidden. But other games, for example, now there's two categories. Those games, for example, by playing, you're just wasting your time. It's called la ya'ni. And la ya'ni, nor will you be rewarded in this world, nor will you be punished in the hereafter. It's just wasting time. It's just spending time doing something. The new craze that came out of FIFA 17 and every other game that comes out. 
if you're doing it for the sake, some people say, look, no, I'm doing it just to, you know, keep my brain intact. And you pray all them brain things. That's fine. If you want to say that, no problem. You can play for that reason. I'm doing it to spend time with some friends and family. Alhamdulillah. If that is your ways, way of spending time with friends and family, I don't see anything wrong with that at all. If there's something, you know, promoting evil, promoting uh, violence, then we should be very careful who plays that game. Children, if a game says 18 plus, there's a reason why it's 18 plus, even if it's a shooting game. It's a very big reason. Because you don't want to spoil and, uh, you know, spoil the minds and poison the minds of children and people that are not into this. You shouldn't introduce that to them. But our point is, Islam says that no. Allowed. If Islam allows a certain leeway, take that leeway for keeping Allah Ta'ala happy. Do not disobey Allah. So if it's a game of you know monopoly, or you know, you're dealing with paper, but now you're missing your salah, you're missing fajr salah, or you're not praying salah on time, then that game can be questioned. Hey, we go for one hour football, alhamdulillah, very good. Keeping yourself physically fit, perfect, well done. But you're going at what time? Uh, yeah, I'm going 8 till 9. Maghrib salahs are 8.20. So, yeah, we're going to have to pray Maghrib qaza. Then that football is not good for you. Then that football is not good for you. I'm sorry. If you're praying salah in football, i.e. it's you know, 8.20 and you're like, guys, let's pray salah on the pitch. Subhanallah. What an example. What an amazing example. That you're playing, you're busy, you know, you're distracted, but you haven't forgotten Allah. Inshallah, you'll be rewarded for that. You're busy playing, but when it comes to salah time, you can stop that game. You can say, you know what, pause, let's pause the game. Half time, let's put it on pause. Let's go pray our salah. Let's go pray salah. That is a very good sign, alhamdulillah. Why? Because that game has not made you into a state of ghaflat, mm-hmm. where now you are away from Allah Ta'ala. If you can be reminded and you can focus on Allah, no problem. But we should be very, very, very careful with what kind of games that we ourselves play and what we allow our children to play. You wouldn't realize now, but the studies show that sometimes children playing on iPads and playing these kind of games where they just touch screen, they are being numbed down and their brain is becoming a sponge. In, not a, in a good way. In a way that they're just jelly. They're just clicking away and touching the iPad and touching the screen and that's all they do. They're losing essential skills. So is someone saying completely take away games? No, control your time on games. That's all that's being said. Control your time on games. You yourself, your younger siblings, if you have nephew and nieces, try to control the time on games. And actually, before you see, you know, now what's happened, everyone's an iPad and everyone's promoting the iPad and everyone's got all the new latest games. Check it. If it's a younger brother or younger sibling or nephew or niece, check what game they're playing. Actually check. And you yourself would realize, especially now after that many years, that these kind of games, we didn't have them kind of games in our time. Fifteen years ago, it was something else. Now they're, they're being told to do the most simplest things, but it looks like so, you know, like a great task and it looks like an adventure. Before there were real games, you know what I mean? I know there was really, real good games back in the days. It goes up to like, you know, level 20 and level 25. You had to actually work, you know, day and night for it. But now it's become very simple. Think about it. We're becoming very, very narrow. We're becoming very weak in our abilities, in our, in our skills. So we should try to take away. And I'm going to say something more. Studies show that very educated families, and I'm not talking Muslims anymore, general British educated families, they do not allow. And I'm not saying five minutes. I mean they do not allow consoles. They do not allow iPads into their homes for their children until a certain age, until after 9, 10, until after 11, 12, 13. Why? Because they themselves know that it's not, it's not good for my child. It's harmful. So me and you as Muslims that want the best in this world and in the hereafter, we should really ask ourselves to. We should go to the experts and find out. We should actually know what you should do. We should go to the game designers and ask them why they did what they did. And you yourself ask them to their own children play them games. And I can tell you this much from the sources that I've read. The designers of these games... Their own children are not allowed to have iPads. Their own children are not allowed to play them games. And you care for your own better than everyone else. So think about that. May Allah ta'ala make us amongst those people that really um, focus on our lives. May Allah make that every sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa we try to adopt into our lives. May Allah ta'ala make us so that whenever we have children or whenever we know of anyone having children, that we uh, follow the way of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa and we do the tahniq. May Allah ta'ala make it so that we make dua for our children. May Allah make it so that we ask the pious to make dua for our children. May Allah make us amongst those people that really focus on our cleansiness. 
May Allah make us pure inside and out. May Allah make us pure people. Even these things will have an effect, inshallah. Allah allow us so that we speak to people with muhabbat, with love. Allah allow us so that we save ourselves from those activities and those futile activities that will make a person go far from Allah. Allah allow us so that whenever we have our free time and we're playing games or we're busy in different activities, Allah allow us so that when the call of prayer comes, when realization of any uh, farz act comes upon our head, that we are the first to stop the activity and turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah, we will carry on from next week. And the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa just to summarize why Imam Bukhari mentioned all these topics was because he started off with circumcision, he promoted cleanliness, he spoke about the importance of being clean, and he spoke about how it has effect on children also by mentioning children. And then he spoke about games. Next week, Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi will speak to me and you about how a Muslim doesn't fall into the same trap twice. That will be the first hadith. And then next week also, we will speak about a very important topic which has been going around just yesterday and will be going around for the next one or two weeks, which is about doubts and waswasa and having ill thoughts, negative thoughts, thoughts about the thoughts about other people. How do we tackle these things? Inshallah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, hadith will inshallah make things a bit more easier for me and you. One or two announcements, sorry, before everyone jumps off and flies away, which is number one, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, as you all know, the 29th of October, Saturday, half one till approximately five o'clock, Sheikh Zaid Mahmood and Sheikh Hassan Ali, Hafizahum Allah Ta'ala, they are coming. Al Adab will be hosting, inshallah. So please, please continue to spread the word. Those of you that are on Facebook, that are on Instagram, that are on Twitter, that are on WhatsApp, please do send the. On Snapchat, please do send the information forward. Please remind people to also sign up. It's a free uh, event, free signing up, free registration. It just makes things easier for the organizing that we know how many people we're working with. That's number one. Number two is, that's on the 29th. Thereafter, on the 31st, we, which is Halloween night, we have something called Al-Adab's Halal Ween. Not Halloween, Halal Ween night. Uh, we did this last year, alhamdulillah, went really, really well. This year we'll also be presenting a talk, and it's the topic is halal ween, and this year's topic is jinns. And with jinns, how to protect ourselves, what do we do when we see a jinn, but if you do see a jinn, how do we deal with jinns, we'll be talking about that. We might relay some stories too, it might be a very thrilling, very dark, spooky setting too, inshallah. So that's an invite to everyone, a poster will be ready very soon, that's after the... 29th, so that's something else to keep in mind. And thirdly, as you all know, as I've said to you all, Al Adal Mufrid is coming to an end. And I'm not even joking when I say now, literally, I can take away my thumb now, too. That's how many you know, numbers of lessons we've got left. Mm-hmm. So it's actually very, very, the countdown is literally, it's not even a countdown now, it's literally a 3, 2, 1, go. So what's happened now is um, the end of the class is coming very, very soon. Inshallah, there will be the confirmed date will be told to everyone very soon, Inshallah. But please do come for the last few lessons now. Imam Bukhari is going to really summarize a lot of things and a lot of things are coming up. Please try to take part. Tell those that have been coming, tell them to take part. The barakah of the lessons is in the actual sitting and then especially, Inshallah, when the final completion will take place. So, Inshallah, I hope you can all be there till the end. May Allah Allah accept everyone. May Allah always keep us sincere. May Allah accept every single person sitting here for your love, for your love for Quran, for your love for Hadith, for your love for attending these Friday lessons. In reality, if you guys didn't come, it wouldn't have been possible. So may Allah Allah always be happy with you. May Allah make your means that the way today we're sitting and we've got a book in front of us to discuss the words of the Prophet. May Allah reunite us all in Jannah.